welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming. And now we can start with a little announcement. I will now like to introduce Aya Chanda, who will now introduce me. <laughs> Hello. That's enough. This is Ajahn Graham, the infamous monk from Perth. I'm very delighted to have you in Manchester. It's been a while since we were here, and I think we did two uh, we did two talks at the time. Yes. And this time it's like we've put them all together, so it's really a huge group, and it's wonderful to see you all. I know many of you, and lovely to have the venerables as well. From the which tradition? From the Zen tradition, or Peace Temple ah, in Manchester. Okay. Lancaster, fantastic, Excellent. nice to see you. <laughs> and without further ado, now I'm going to hand over to Ajahn Brahms who will introduce himself, I guess. Well, you already did that. Can you introduce my tradition? Uh, Combination? I think that's your job. Okay. <laughs> so my Buddhist tradition, if you didn't know, is a combination, trying to combine the H from Hinayana, the Aha, from Mahayana and the Yana from Vajrayana. And what does that spell? Hahayana. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you've understood it. In other words, to try and make these teachings entertaining. Otherwise, that people go back home and they don't remember anything of it. I first became a Buddhist about 55 years ago uh, in UK. And I remember the first talks I went to. Often after the talk was finished, I'd discuss it with my friends and we'd all say, that was very profound. i say, that was very profound. They asked me, yeah, it was profound. I didn't understand it either. <laughs> so when you make the talk more understandable, it can also be very amusing. And when it's amusing, it gets to people's hearts much easier. So what we're going to do, we can start with some peace time. I had a very peaceful day today. My plate was full of peas. Oh, come on. <laughs> That was true. Anyway, uh, so now instead of eating peas, we can practice peace by doing a, maybe 20 minutes of guided meditation. Are you up for that? Yes. Really up for it? Yes. Really, really? Yes. That's better. <laughs> I like to get people motivated. So let's get started. So it's only 20 minutes, that's not long. So however you're seated, that's good enough. So first of all, when you're going to meditate, please can you learn how to relax. Relax to the max. I often say that, that's not a joke. See how much you can relax your own body, first of all. Because that takes mindfulness together with kindness. Sitting here, eyes closed. You're in a safe place. No one's going to do you any harm. You're just going to get an enormous amount of benefit. And in a few days ago, I was teaching a retreat. And in that retreat, I gave the simile of the thousand petaled lotus, which is you. To open the lotus so the inner petals can be seen and enjoyed. The sun has to come up in the morning, and the warmth and light of the sun opens out that lotus. So the warmth and the light of the sun 
is represented by the combination of mindfulness and kindness, what we call kindfulness. So you look at your body with awareness and kindness. Is there any part of your body which is hurting right now? Perhaps you've been working hard today and have got a migraine. Perhaps you've got a sore tummy. Perhaps you've got an ache or a pain somewhere else in your body. See if you can go towards it rather than away from it. As if you are focusing on it with the warmth and the light of the sun of kindfulness. After a while, you can learn how to relax that part of your body, relaxing it to the max. You know you are relaxing it because mindfulness allows you to get feedback. You can experience how those sensations are changing. And as they change, if they change for the worse, then stop. Find another direction. But a lot of times you'll be surprised. You learn how to relax some of those aches and pains in the body or even diseases and bring them to a state of peaceful calm until your whole body is probably more calm and peaceful than it has been for a while. When your body is calm and relaxed and reasonably at peace, then you can go deeper inside. Inside what? The next layer of petals on this lotus after the body, I like to call time. Many of us are prisoners of time, rushing to get here, making sure I don't talk too much. But now, I like to go away from the past, avoid the future, and come into this beautiful present moment called now. I know I said this simile a few days ago in Sheffield, but nevertheless, I'm going to say it again. Imagine you're sitting here, keep your eyes closed, and in your left hand you're carrying a very heavy shopping bag which you've been carrying for such a long time it means your arms ache your shoulder hurts and your hand is very sore and you're also holding another shopping bag in your right hand that also makes your right hand, arm and shoulder hurt been carrying it around for too long. You look at the shopping bag in your left hand and that has the four letters on the outside which say P-A-S-T. It represents your past and all those memories, good and bad, which you keep in that shopping bag and it makes it heavier and heavier and heavier. And you look at the shopping bag in your right hand, that's also full to the brim. And the words on the outside, the letters on the outside of that bag are F-U-T-U-R-E. That represents your future with all your fears and anxieties and hopes and dreams as well, both positive and negative. And that's also really heavy. Now I'm not telling you to throw those away. I'm suggesting you can focus on the shopping bag in the left hand first of all, representing your past. 
and imagine you're leaning to your left, which allows you to lower that shopping bag representing your past onto the floor. And as soon as it meets the floor, all the weight, the burden which tires you, is taken away. And that allows you to open your hand, move your left arm away from that shopping bag, relax and re-energize the left side of your body. And then you focus on the shopping bag in your right hand and you lower that to the ground. Do it slowly and imagine you're lowering it closer and closer to the floor. When it meets the ground, you can move your hand away. The floor will support the weight. So now your right hand and arm can relax and recuperate. And as you have let those past and future burdens onto the floor, you know they're going to be safe. No one is going to steal them. You're just resting. A deserved period of relaxation. And as you've lowered them down to the floor, you can imagine that you, you are standing in this amazing spot between the past and the future, called the present moment. It's safe, it's comfortable. Whenever you want, you can pick up those bags again, but right now, leave them on the floor, as you can relax in this present moment. And please know, you learn much more from the present moment than you can ever learn from the past. And also, your future, your future is made in this present moment. That's why this present moment is so valuable. So look upon this moment with mindfulness and kindness. Relax it until this moment becomes a literal place of rest and retreat. You're just here, and no one is judging you, no one is asking you to do something in the future. All judging and planning belong to the past and future, not to now. You're just here, just be resting. <coughs> and as you're resting in this present moment, see how much, how deeply you can focus in this moment. When you get deeply into the present moment, you find yourself Silent. There's nothing to say. You don't need to assess, to judge, to measure, to give things names. Just know without giving things a name. Be kind and you get to some amazing deep states of relaxation. And please don't pick up those bags yet. So time has got no meaning. You're just here right now. And you're not judging or naming. You're just knowing in this moment. not going anywhere, not doing anything, just relaxing to the max.
for those who have meditated a lot, you may notice without even deciding to do this, often you become aware of your breathing. It doesn't matter where that awareness is located, you just know the breath is coming in and the breath is going out. Just imagine that breath is like a rocking chair. You're sitting on it, breath going in, breath going out. It gives you some satisfaction as you watch the breath naturally without forcing it come in and go out. If you like to be more active, then imagine as the breath comes into your body, it brings in these wonderful qualities of peace, health, energy, or just choose one of those. Breathing in peace. And imagine peace, maybe like a a white dove flowing in with your breath into your heart. Another bird of peace flowing in. As you start to fill your heart with peace. Breathing out, let go. Any problems, pain, diseases, difficulties, Imagine it flowing out with your outbreath, riding on those waves of air and going out into the universe where it's diluted and disappears. Breathing in peace, without sickness. Don't just do this for one minute. Do this little exercise for three or four or five minutes. And you'll find that your heart does become filled with peace. And any diseases, even tumours, get reduced.
So how do you feel right now? How has the meditation changed you in the last 15 or 20 minutes? How do you feel? What worked for you? So now we finish the meditation. Please open your eyes. And in order to get the meditation results out into the normal daily life, please smile when you open your eyes. One reason why I ask this, because I have to face you <laughs> and when you're not miserable, when you open your eyes, that really <laughs> is disappointing for me. So thank you for smiling. Excellent. So now we're going to give the Dhamma talk, the talk, or whatever you call it, and it's on the Buddhist optimism, was it? Yeah, okay. I usually start on subjects, but I don't guarantee I'll finish on the subject. <laughs> You just see how the talk just evolves. But first of all, I don't know about you, but a lot of times people always want their life to be perfect. How many people in this hall have an imperfect life? <laughs> Everyone. So what's wrong? Absolutely nothing. Welcome to life. Some years ago, I was invited to give a, a lecture at a, a mental health week over in, uh, in Perth, Australia, sponsored by the government. And this was for the clients of mental health not the, the doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists, but I, <laughs> but the people who were uh, being dealt with by those people. Excellent. Come and sit anywhere. Hi. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, after I gave my talk, a couple of the people came out and they said, we need to apologize to you. Ajahn Brahm, we need to apologize to you. Now this language is a bit coarse, but here in Manchester I think you can probably understand it. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Manchester, it's just like people are honest up here. So they said, when you first came in, you weren't a doctor, you weren't wearing a white coat, you weren't a professor. We thought, who is this wanker coming to talk to us? That's what they said. I didn't make that word up. <laughs> but then they said, we came to apologize for thinking that. Because during the talk, you made us laugh and cry. Thank you. And the story which really affected them, which I'm going to repeat now, <laughs> was that um, I said the story, because being a monk in my tradition is not just a Hahayana tradition, we call it like the forest tradition. We try and live in places which are kind of remote. It's one of the reasons I'm here to try and get more support for Anukampa, bhikkhunis, nuns, the first bhikkhuni, actually the only bhikkhuni in UK right now. Only one in the whole of this country. Trying to get a nice uh, forest. Have a nice meditation center where you can all visit and other people can become bhikkhunis. But anyway, I've lived in the forest as a bhikkhu for 49 years now. And by living in a forest, if you're mindful, you're aware, you learn so much. One of the things I've learned over all these years is there's no such thing as a perfect tree. I know that some of you 
are visiting from Germany. Many people in Germany, they love their forests. But I've never yet seen a German forest lover going to the forest and straightening up all the trees, getting rid of the ones which aren't beautiful and just planting new ones. Every tree in every forest is bent, twisted, with uh, limbs, branches missing, and lots of brown leaves. Actually, I love the brown leaves in the forest this time of the year, because they match my robes. My robes become camouflage, <laughs> and yours too. <laughs> if I needed to escape from someone, just go into a forest, you'd never find me. <laughs> but, but also, many of those trees have got holes in them, just where a big branch has been blown off by the wind, or just where something has struck that tree, or there's been a fire, and the, the trunks of those trees are all damaged. I don't think I've ever seen any tree in any natural forest which isn't damaged. And in fact, those damaged trees honestly are my favourites. If ever I wanted to have a picture taken in a forest under those damaged trees, they're the most beautiful. And so, if you think that you are damaged goods, because of what's happened to you so far in your life, if think, you think you're all bent and twisted, welcome. Number one, you belong. You belong to nature, the most beautiful forest of humanity in the world. Never think that you're excluded. Welcome. Number two, the more twisted and bent you are, <laughs> and, the, and the more beautiful you become. And there's a, there's a very deep truth in that. And that's when I told that to the victims Oh, the clients of the mental health services in Perth. That's why they all cried and laughed as well. They were feeling welcome, no matter what had ever happened to them. And this is, I haven't told this story in this tour yet, but this is one of the most powerful stories. You know in the books which I've written, been translated into many language, languages, one of those stories and I mention this because some of my relations are here today. And is Bender here? No, she's not. Hi, Bender. Hi, nice to see you. I haven't seen you for at least 55 years. I came to your marriage when I was young. Yeah, it's great to see you. But you know, she is my real cousin. Her mum was my dad's sister. She's called a sis, yeah. Anyway, well, one of the things that your uncle taught me, that's my dad, that he was poor and he took me in his old car, I still remember the road in, actually I forgot it, Churchfield, <laughs> Churchfield Road in Acton. And he parked the car and he gave me this wonderful bonding experience. I was about 14 at the time. And he said, son, whatever happens to you in your life, however you turn out, good or bad, he didn't know how I was going to turn out, I want you to always remember the door of my house will always be open to you, no matter what. I was a 14-year-old male. Males are not known for their emotional maturity, even when they're 14 and not 14. <laughs> I never understood it, but I knew it was important. And I would add that my dad lived in a council flat, which was really poor. He'd never used to lock the door of the house. When I said, are you afraid of burglars? He said, no, the opposite. 
If a burglar came in, they may take pity on us and leave something. <laughs> you know the Liverpool Scouts that say it's a humour. So, but I knew it was important. Unfortunately, my dad died two years later, when I was 16. But nevertheless, I remember that story. It was important. One of the nice things about like, being a monastic, you have time. Time to sort of actually grow your understanding of your own intelligence and emotions. And to be able to learn from some important teachings you knew were important, but you didn't really understand at the time. And so, I realized that what my father really meant was the door of his heart will always be open to me, no matter how I turned out. He would never reject me. He would never judge me. He'd never exclude me. I was his son. Good or bad, I was his son. That was the most important. Can you imagine what that felt like when you understood what he meant? What he was talking to me about in Buddhism, as you would know, is the unconditional love. And you're my son, that's enough. And I use that description, opening the door of your heart, no matter what you ever do. It's a beautiful way to encourage this peace in your own life. There will come a time in your life when you look at yourself, there'll be in a mirror, and hopefully say to yourself, me, the person you can never escape from, the one you've known since almost forever. Sometimes you can be so hard on yourself. And sometimes it's like you're excluding yourself. There was one day you say to yourself, me, with all my faults, all the silly things which I've done, all the bad things which you've done, the door of my heart is open to me, unconditionally. Sometimes I never realized how powerful that was. <laughs> Sometimes I've done some stupid things when I was young. You know one of the stupid things I did? You know, my, my dad was talking about his youth up in Liverpool and he said, he used to go scrumping apples. That's called stealing. Well, I never knew that. My brother never knew that. So we went scrumping apples the next day. My brother got caught. And my, <laughs> my dad, he, you know, Bill, he, he couldn't, he could not um, punish us. Because he just told us the day before to do that. So I've done some bad things in my time, but what do you do when you've done a bad thing which has hurt somebody else? You learn from it. Punishment destroys the problem underground. Because when people get punished, they lie first of all, so they didn't really do it. So we're honest, that's an important part you know, of any spiritual tradition, which is based on love, truth. Whatever you've done, be honest, get forgiveness, and then we learn. Over in Australia, I don't know if anybody has been to Australia, any Australians here, they have this football code, Australian Football League, AFL. And I, that's so popular, that's more popular than soccer, believe it or not, in Australia. The reason is because Australians are no good at soccer. <laughs> so the AFL, I've used that as what to do when you've done something wrong or made a mistake. Acknowledge. Number two, forgive. Number three, learn. Never to do that again. And that's all you need. Honestly, I do not believe in punishment. 
it does a huge amount of difficult things in this world for the, the planet. If somebody's done something and they're dangerous to society, yeah, put them in quarantine for a while, but not in jail. But anyhow, I've, I've worked a lot in prisons in my life as a monk. You know, once, this comes to my mind, I was teaching a meditation retreat. We have our own retreat center over in Perth. And when I was teaching, the person who was supposed to be doing the cooking for us, that uh, her husband got cancer. She had to look after her husband rather than cooking for us. So I was left without a cook for 60 people on retreat at the last minute. I managed to find somebody who was willing to do all that cooking for free. And he was an amazing cook. Now one of the things he did, which I couldn't believe, he'd make pizza, no, lots of them, you know, for 60 people, and a ravenous monk. <laughs> I'm not ravenous, but anyway, I do eat a lot. <laughs> he would do it, everything by himself. He'd make the dough, just from some flour, and I don't know what else he'd put into it. And they were absolutely delicious. You know, hot, fresh, and lots of other dishes as well, all by himself. He was one of the most amazing cooks I've ever seen in my life, all by himself. And anyway, at the end of our retreat, now we all come together and say thanks to everybody. And all the retreatants, they all said, where's Carl? We want to say thank you to Carl, he's disappeared, he's not here today. I said, yes, he's not here today, he's gone back to prison. And I kind of shocked them. Prison, what's he done? He was on work release. I knew him very well. And they asked, what did he do in, to be in prison? And I said, rape. Now each one of you, I could feel you're quite surprised. And they said, what, Ajahn Brahm? You allowed a person convicted of rape to come and cook for us for nine days? I said, yes. I used to go to the prison regularly every week to teach. I trusted him. And I said that he'd done that terrible crime several times when he was young, influenced by drugs, heavy use of drugs. He gave up those drugs a long time ago. Now, he still has to be in jail for a while, but I gave him the opportunity to cook for you to do some service. Not just because I needed a cook. I wanted to, each one of you to learn to be non-judgmental. That rapist part of him disappeared a long time ago. He's now a good person. I trusted him. I said, I was absolutely uh, confident he would never do anything bad at all. I wanted you to see what it was like when a person has done something bad in the past and is still suffering for it now. And they all, <laughs> they all were told me to send all their best wishes to Carl the next time I went to visit jail. Of course, that was quite a few years ago. Carl is now happily married, has a nice job, a model citizen. That's acknowledge, forgive, and learn. Learn from our mistakes. So if you've ever done anything wrong in your life, if you're afraid of being punished, you will lie. You'll say, I never did that, or you know, someone else did that. But if there's no punishment, it's the, op the opportunity for learning. Why do people take drugs? Why do people do those terrible things to each other? Can't we forgive and have a much more peaceful and beautiful and harmonious society? 
we can if we are willing to acknowledge, forgive, and learn from these things. How does the learning actually happen? There was this <coughs> a man in, okay, let's say in Manchester. And as he was walking down the street one evening, he trod in a big pile of shit. S-H-I-T. Can I say that in Manchester? Thank you. In the United States, you can't say that. They're so backwards. <laughs> and it was all got all over his feet. So he went to the side of the road to scrape it off. Then this big bikey came down the, the road after him, you know, with all of the, the bikey gear and the, the chains and the levers and the tattoos on him. And he also trod in that same pile of shit. And the first guy told the bikey, I did that. <laughs> and the bikey punched him. <laughs> okay, I feel we've got that stupid joke. <laughs> anyway, if you don't understand it, ask the person sitting next to you. <laughs> what happens? <laughs> it's okay to laugh. So that's one of the other similes which I've often taught. And I said in the last retreat, where it came from. Now, as a monk, I've been a monk for almost 50 years now, I had some wonderful places where I could meditate. One of those places was in a cave in the north of Thailand, up in the mountains. And I was attracted to that place it was in the middle of a tea plantation. And I'm English. I love my tea. This is where they actually made it. I had as much tea as I could possibly drink for free. But there was also a lovely cave in there. I used to go in there every day for about six or seven hours to meditate. And there were lots of bats in that cave. And I had such wonderful meditation, lots of peace and tranquility and joy there. I loved that cave. And so even today, and this is no exaggeration, this is not a joke, whenever I smell bat poo, it's one of the most delightful smells. It's delightful, it's, <laughs> it's fragrant, because it brings back all these wonderful associations of happy times in my bat cave. But more than that, it was a bat cave, thousands of bats every day. More than that, in the front of that bat cave was a papaya tree. And that papaya tree got so much of the S-H-I-T, the shit from the bats, as they came in in the morning, as they flew out in the evening. And that was the only tree there. And that papaya tree, or rather those papayas, were the sweetest and juiciest and most delicious papaya I've ever had in my whole life. Now, as a monk, we can't actually ask for any of those fruits. But what I did when I saw that one of those fruits was about to ripen, I'd tell one of the lay people, oh, look at that papaya over there. And they'd always get it for me. <laughs> you know how big a papaya is? Honestly, I would eat the whole lot. I wouldn't leave anything. Because it was that delicious, honestly. The most sweetest, juiciest, papaya you've ever eaten in your life. And I always remember when you'd bite into it and the juice would drip down your cheek. I would always remember what I was really eating. That shit. <laughs> it was! <laughs> but it'd be, it'd be transformed into this delicious papaya, which was really healthy for me. So, the moral of that story is, 
if anything difficult happens to you in your life, if there's some suffering in your life, if things don't go the way you expected in your life, how many people have had things which you'd never expected happen? Come on. <laughs> and how many of those things have been suffering? Come on, put your hand up. <laughs> what do you do? Do you complain? Why me? Look at me, I'm over 72 now. I should be retired. I should be living a nice life in a monastery somewhere by the beach. Try some monasteries by the beach. With my feet up, just enjoying all the fruit of the hard work of my life. Can I do that? No, of course you can. For a while. <laughs> For a while. So, I have to work hard at such an old age. Now, I live with many monks and nuns, and those monks, they're so kind. Now the nuns are wisely, you haven't heard what I say, what kindness means. I said to them, I said, I'm getting old now. And they replied, Ajahn Brahm, you're not getting old. Oh, that was so sweet. They said, you're already old. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I never said the nuns. Okay. Or he might hit me. <laughs> But anyhow, sort of those little stories, what do you do with mistakes and suffering in life? What's the purpose of it? You know, a lot of times if you can give any event in life, especially unpleasant events, meaning, what does it mean that that happened to you? If you can give it meaning, find meaning in it, it becomes far more acceptable. Why did that person go to jail? What was the meaning of that? It should be the learning, the growth, becoming a better person. If you can give it meaning, then it's far more endurable. But anyway, I was going to go deeper into this subject of opening the door of your heart. Because honestly, some of the stuff with monks and nuns say is actually, it is very powerful. And the many people over in my city in Australia, Perth, many of them are psychiatrists and psychologists. And they say they get permission to practice as psychologists or psychiatrists by going to university. But they said all the important, useful stuff they get from our talks. It was just such a wonderful a bit of praise. And I found out what they meant when they invited me to go to one of their little groups, which was called ASSETS. ASSETS was an acronym for the Australian Society of Survivors of Torture and Trauma. You know what happens in our world? There are some places in this world where the way they treat other human beings is absolutely, I mean, really disgusting. And some of these women, men, they manage to get a refugee visas to come to Australia when they tell what they've been through and they survive, which is a miracle. At least they can give them sanctuary in a big country like Australia. And the same happens in the UK. When a person comes to a new country, their body may be free, but their heart, their emotions are still in those military underground cells, being raped and beaten for no reason. Some of the people, when they hear their stories, and it is absolutely gross, and you know, 
sometimes you find hard to find words. Gross is just small compared to what they've been through. But this little group of psychologists, they were using opening the door of your heart to heal sufferers of torture for no reason at all, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Someone didn't like you. Or they just knew you had a view, not reasonably political, just like the human, compassionate view, and put you away somewhere and almost beat you to death. So anyway, these sufferers of torture were asked when it was ready, when they felt safe, not something you can force on anybody, when they felt physically safe to sit down on a seat and do this opening the door of your heart meditation. Call it meditation, call it exercise, whatever you want. And in this meditation, close your eyes. And when you feel relaxed and safe, which is so important, you imagine two doors in your heart region, just like the two doors which you came in to this room. Imagine those two doors opening up. You are inside. This is the person you are at ease with. That part of you which is not feeling afraid, which is not sort of thinking of all these terrible things which have happened to you. The part of you you feel comfortable with. But when you open those doors, you see outside on the hard, cold concrete, these little girls who were you when you were 12, 13, 14 was so badly abused, you can never understand why. These little kids were beaten and tortured. You don't know why. But they're part of you. Can you imagine like these old aircraft, these stairs come, coming out from where you're standing, from inside where it's safe. The stairs come out to the ground. And that's when you do the hard work of inviting each one of those little people who were raped, beaten, abused, tortured. Invite each one of them up those stairs. Come in. You are part of me. Come in. And this is just Traumatic, that's the only word I can find for this. One by one, you can do maybe a couple of these events a day, or a week, or a month. Each one of them comes in. You give them this big embrace and hug. I will never keep you out ever again. The result, please excuse me for getting emotional, but I've seen this too many times. This one lady, I remember more than anyone else, what she had been through was, you don't want to repeat to anybody. But she was telling that to one of our members, our Buddhist meditators in Australia. And this young man was saying, that's awful what happened to you. Who could ever do such a thing to you? That's terrible. And she turned on him and said, what do you mean that was terrible? That is who I am. That is me. It's not terrible. Stop judging me. That has given me meaning in life. To us understand what it's like. What I can never understand. What it's like to have been treated like that. And not only understand it, but know the way out. You know, sometimes you meet people and what they've been through is disgusting. I can actually give them kindness. This lady can actually hold their hand and say, I know 
what it feels like. But more than that, I know the way out. Come with me. And she was one of these women I've met in life, incredibly strong, like a little angel. To turn all that pain which I probably was never able to endure, turned it into something which had meaning for her and others, to be able to assist and help. That is why we can turn the biggest amount of rotten shit into the juiciest of papaya. And when you actually see that happening, you know it's possible. It gives our life meaning whatever happens to you. Never expect life to be perfect. You know, once I was a school teacher for one year. When I was a school teacher, I learned a lot being a school teacher. What I really learned was that all the naughty children sat in the back. <laughs> no, you're not naughty children, you're naughty adults. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I did though, I had to I set a test, an exam, in maths. That was my subject, maths. I love setting exams in maths. I even do that to children, even today. Are you good at maths? See how good you are. Listen carefully. 26 sheep in a field, 10 die, how many survive? If you heard this before, shut up. <laughs> 26 sheep in a field, 10 die, how many survive? 16? No, wrong. No, not 19. No. No. 26 sheep in the field, 10 die. How many survive? The answer is 10. I'll say it again. 26 sheep in the field, 10 die. Did you say 10? Yeah, I know, I ignored it. <laughs> No, it's just, you know, whenever we give talks, even if it's really serious, like I was just getting, every now and again it's nice to lighten it. It's like the adverts in the middle of a, <laughs> of some very uh, do bad documentary. But anyhow, <laughs> when I was setting this exam, I never had set an exam before. And so I asked a senior teacher, <coughs> how do I set an exam? And they said, the most important thing is not to set it too hard. If it's too hard, then if everybody sort of gets sort of you know, three out of ten or four out of ten, they'll all think it's a bad, uh, they can't do math. It's not they can't do math, so I just set the exam too hard. So the result will be just turning people away from mathematics. If I set it too easy, then everyone will get 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10. Yeah, they think they can do maths, but they don't learn anything. So someone told me, try and get the average result 7 out of 10. If you get 70%, then that means you can do maths. It's encouraging you. But the most important part of that exam was the 30% where they make mistakes. That was my feedback as their teacher. I discovered what they hadn't learned yet. If they didn't do well, it was my fault. I hadn't taught them properly or encouraged them properly or given them interest properly. So that 30% I thought was the most important part of the exam where people made mistakes. That's where they could learn and grow and become better in the future. So I also say that to each one of you. If you're married, and if 
to know that your partner in life is only 70%. You're so lucky. You'll be able to learn so much. If they're 100%, it'll drive you crazy. They're too perfect. If they're 40%, again, it's terrible. But if you've got a man or a woman who's 70%, well done, that's the best. You can learn so much together. That's actually what happens a lot of times, you know. I don't know why, but they ask monks, monks to do marriage counselling. <laughs> I've never been married. What would I know? Well, I found out why. The reason why they ask monks to do marriage counselling or nuns is because we're cheap. <laughs> 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 it's true, isn't it? You don't charge, yeah. <laughs> it's not only that, we do have some interesting perspectives on it. On this, for example, this is, these two Thai ladies years ago, they were sisters. And so they came for marriage counselling together. And the elder sister, she had this Australian husband who was driving her crazy. And she really wanted to be get a separation and divorce. I kind of tried to talk her out of it. But then, her uh, uh, younger sister, she was one of these women who was always looking for a partner, could only keep them for about a month or five weeks at the, the maximum, then all fall apart. She wanted a husband but just couldn't find one. So I thought of a solution. Really obvious. Don't know why no one else thought of it. Your sisters. Your elder sister's got a husband she doesn't want, and the younger sister wants one. Obvious. <laughs> Swap. <laughs> they wouldn't have it. Anyway, never mind. So there's other things which you say with the a lot of the difficulties we face in life, that's where we can learn. And honestly, that that book which I wrote, and it's given that title, Open the Door of Your Heart, in Thai, Chun Mun Chun, over in German, De Kuh de Weinti, The Cow That Cried. And it's very good to, if you write a book, give it different titles. Because then in the bookshop, people buy this book and the same book and another book. It's the same book, but it's got three different titles. Therefore you make three times as much royalties. Is that, is that fair? Well, I don't get any money from it anyway. That's our Buddhist society. But nevertheless, the opening the door of your heart, the first story in that was the two bad bricks in the wall story, which is one of my favorite ones. And that two bad bricks in the wall was so powerful that uh, one day I got this airline ticket in the post from the, the Australian Embassy in Bangkok. And they said there were four couples that they worked in the embassy or they were associated with the embassy. All couples. Two were already divorced. And the other two were separated, pending divorce proceedings. And they'd read that book in the Aussie embassy. And that was enough to bring those four couples together again. The two who were divorced came together and the two who were separated also came together. It's such a fantastic book of stories. It healed their marriages. And they said, we want you to come to Bangkok to teach at the embassy, which I did many years ago. And they said the story which really meant so much to them was the two bad bricks in the wall. And that story, the two bad bricks in the wall, if you don't know it, 
when I first went to Australia, if you want to know actually why I went to Australia, and this is not an exaggeration, I'm not going over time, am I? No. I'm not going over time. <laughs> okay, I'll tell that next year. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so that particular story, it all came about when I first, I don't know, when I first went to Australia. The only reason I went to Australia, because I was born in England. The only reason I went there was I made a resolution, like a promise. I will not decide to go anywhere, because my teacher, who's Ajahn Chah, he will send me. And when he wants me to come back, he will ask me to come back. I will not decide by myself. I'll be at service. So they needed a monk in Australia. So he sent me to Australia. Two weeks after I arrived in Australia, Ajahn Chah had a stroke and couldn't speak anymore. That's how, how I've been stuck in Australia. <laughs> That's actually true, believe it or not. But anyway, when I was in Australia, we needed a monastery, but like we needed a monastery for the nuns. And so we got some land, in debt for the land, but beautiful land. We had no buildings at all. So I had to learn how to build. In life, I was a theoretical physics, physicist and a math teacher not a builder, so nevertheless I had to learn how to lay bricks. When I laid my first brick wall, if any of you ever go there, now I lost the location for a long time, it wasn't important to me anymore, it's in the monk's toilet section, that's the first building we made. There's two crooked bricks in there. They're still there. So when I laid my first wall, I made sure that every brick was perfect before I went on to the next brick. And that when, I, when I laid that brick wall, and I took all the time in the world, when it was finished, I stood back and saw that two of those bricks were crooked. They spoiled the whole wall. And I tried to scrape the mortar out, but it was so hard. It was like diamond hard. I tried, there was another monk with me at the time. I asked, can we, can we, can we please buy some dynamite? I'll blow that wall up and start again. I was embarrassed. The first wall I ever laid was spoiled by two bricks which were wrong. For three months, and this is not exaggerating, you'd have nightmares about those bricks. I spoiled it, and we still need lots of donations, and they will never come if they saw how I wasted their donations making terrible looking walls. And then one day, this visitor came, he saw that wall, and he said it was a beautiful wall. And I looked at him, are you blind? Are you visually impaired? Have you left your spectacles in the car? Can't you see those two bad bricks which spoil the whole wall? And he replied, Yes, I can see those two crooked bricks, but I can also see the 998 perfect bricks. And honestly, that hit me like a brick. <laughs> <laughs> It did. It changed my whole attitude. Why is it you make a mistake or two mistakes and that's all you see? I was blind to all the other beautiful bricks in that wall. And once he reminded me of that, there are beautiful bricks in the wall above, below, to the left, to the right. He was right, that was a nice wall. Why do we judge anything by a couple of mistakes? And that's what those four couples, they were Australians. Why do people judge their partner by two bad bricks? What about looking at all the other beautiful bricks that person's done? 
And I call them together again. And those men, women, husbands, hardly done some bad things. You done bad things? Of course you have. Has your partner found out yet? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter if they have. Just there's so many other beautiful things in the world in your partner. Look at those. Water the flowers in the garden, not the weeds. Okay, I can always keep going on. But will we stop now? Should we do some questions, Edward? Questions. Okay. 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 So I'll stop now for questions. Q and A. One of the back already, my goodness, that's fast. So, so please, sir, what's your question? Forgiveness. How to, how to practice forgiveness? Yeah. First of all, some people say forgiveness means you're just uh, allowing other people to carry on making mistakes. So in answer to that question, there was uh, a couple who come to uh, Bodhinyana Monastery where I live and they came to see me for some counselling. She wanted to dump him because she went to take his suit uh, to the dry cleaners and she saw there was some paper in the, that suit and the paper was a receipt for the local house of ill repute. He was seeing prostitutes. The evidence was there. It was a receipt. She had enough of him. So she came to see me with him. And he said, look, I still love my wife. I still love her. Now sometimes you think, how can you still love somebody when you've done something like that? One thing which I know is not to judge too easily. Sometimes you don't understand other people what love means to them. So I was just really trying hard to convince his wife to forgive him. He promised in front of me, he promised in front of the big Buddha statue, he would never, ever, ever do that again. Is that good enough? No. So, we adapted forgiveness to also include what I call parole. There was a period, I think they decided for six months, she had full access to his mobile phones, mobile devices, all the passwords, all of the money, all of the... So he, she could follow him for six months to make sure he could keep the promise never to do anything like that ever again. He had to prove to her that he really meant the fact he wouldn't do it again. And he succeeded. And it's wonderful to see this couple. They usually come to our monastery to feed the monks Every Monday. What day is it today? Sunday. Okay. And it's wonderful to see that they were, she had good reason to separate. But I knew how much it would hurt her and hurt him. So she decided to give him a chance to forgive him. And he took that opportunity. She could trust him now has full access to all of his devices, can ask him where he's been, and why he's been there, and check up on him. And he fulfilled his promise. And they're back together again. You can see they're having a wonderful relationship once more. To me, I thought the outcome was so beautiful. So don't just do forgiveness, do parole. But please give people a chance. Yes? Yeah, uh, how do you uh, work with your impairments, like with health problem, uh, for example, allergy or something like that? How to be okay with that and accept?
Yeah, how, yeah, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. How are you okay with impermanence allergies? First of all, in our society, we're getting much better than when I was small. First of all, make sure that you, people see you, that you're with other people. They get to know that a perfect person is not a person who looks perfect. Now, e so everybody is like uh, the damaged tree in the forest. So first of all, to accept your allergies or uh, different ways of doing things, LGBTQIA+, transgender, everything, binary, I, I keep forgetting, please I apologize if I miss somebody out. First of all, that's who you are. And as a, as a monk, as a human being, as a compassionate person, I hope, will always be accepted. Never think that you are discriminated against. And the worst thing is, you know, as I was a leader in religion, the last thing I'd ever want to do is discriminate or close the door against anyone. You have to practice that, not just say that. The door of my heart is open to you. No matter who you are. No matter what you can do, what you can't do. My job is to make sure that it makes it easier for you, no matter who you are and what you do in life. And sometimes you can always find these amazing opportunities for people who are different. Honestly, these days, please excuse me, but I don't like the word disabled. I think different is better. Because an ability which no person may not have, but I have, they have other abilities which I just don't have. Now, when I was a student, I was a Buddhist when I was at Cambridge, but then I had a friend, he was from Manchester, and he was a devout Christian, we had some wonderful arguments. But then he told me that he was spending one afternoon a week doing some social work in the local mental hospital, helping out people with uh, Down syndrome. And so he said it was once a week he was going there. And I was a Buddhist, and I thought, oh my goodness, I better have to go there as well. I was just, <laughs> I was just trying to keep up with the opposition. So I started going there one afternoon a week to full board hospital <coughs> to help with the Down syndrome. I thought to help, that was a wrong idea of what I was doing. When I went there, my friends, they lasted two or three weeks. I lasted two years there. Every afternoon volunteering when the term was up. But please excuse me for saying these things, but just, one afternoon after two years, I was just, I enjoyed these people, they were my friends. I, I don't really mean that, I learned so much from them. And this one afternoon, I had one group by myself, the first part of the afternoon, another group the second part of the afternoon, and they all came together to thank me. They had all these little cards and little presents for me. I said, why are you doing that now? So if your final exams are next week, you won't be able to come anymore. And I told him, look, it's embarrassing for me to say this, but my final exam's in two weeks. Can I please, please, please come next week? So I came a week after my farewell. And the sort of things which I learned there, this is one example which I love saying. I was came on the bus one afternoon, for the usual afternoon helping, and one of these Down Syndrome people took one look at me and came running up to me and gave me this big hug. And he said, he said to me, what's wrong? My lay name was Peter, Peter Betts. What's wrong? And I couldn't believe it. You know, he knew, saw it straight away, the night before I'd broken up with my girlfriend. I wasn't bored of luck. 
<laughs> he spotted it so quickly. And I realized the emotional intelligence of these people who were institutionalized was so highly developed. And I honestly enjoyed spending the afternoon with them more than spending the afternoon with some Nobel laureate in the colleges. These were real people. These days we call it emotional intelligence. We didn't have that word in those days. But that's what they taught me. Thank you. If I ever see anyone with Down syndrome, I kind of feel grateful for them. For teaching me something I could never learn in the university. So each one of you, no matter who you are, never think of yourself as disabled. Please, different, yes. But you can also contribute to the beauty and the learning in this life. It's important for me. Okay. And I just need to go on. Thank you, Ajahn, for, for coming. The, my, my question is that with the with the war that's happening, like that, there's like two, two million people who bomb food and water. It's extremely distressing to read the news. And what what can we do? What can you do? Uh, food and water. There's more than enough food and water in the wrong places. It's actually maybe trying to get it to people who really need it. That's the most difficult thing. But the long-term thing is, why are there these wars anyway? One of the reasons is that some people are taught that some people aren't the same as us. I'm just saying this with Memo Chanda earlier. That my own grandma, this is my mother's mother. I remember when I was young, she took me aside and said, see those people who are Pakistani? She said, they're not the same as us, you know, they're not the same as us. They eat cat food. <laughs> My goodness, that was so wrong, so racist. But my old grandma, there's no way I could argue with her. That's the sort of stuff, please intermarry. If you, and I'm saying this, I've got this one disciple over in Singapore, uh, she married a Christian. They have two sons, so a Buddhist, a mother, a Christian husband, a Muslim son, and a Hindu daughter or something. There's one family, four religions. And I always was criticizing them, please have another child to make them a Jew. <laughs> Get the full set, the full house. And I say that, I know they'll never do that, but if you actually, in today's world, I mean, how many of you were born in Manchester? One, two, three, four, five. Isn't it wonderful that many of you come from so many different traditions and you come together and you work together, you're friends together, the LGBTQIA+, all the different religions. Okay, I'm going to tell the story when it's too late or not. <laughs> there was this wonderful uh, man who worked so hard for his children. He lived up in you know, some village up in the mountains. He worked so hard for his kids and they all went to a nice school, they did well at university, they got nice jobs, nice positions, good salaries. And they thought, we're going to invite our father to the city for the first time in his life. So he came to the city and the first day in the city he heard this terrible noise. <laughs> You know, because I'm a monk for so long, I don't mind making a fool of myself. <laughs> I try. 
but my visual effects are very limited. So anyway, he was, <laughs> he was so interested, what was causing this sound? So he followed the noise to the back room of a house and there he saw this young boy just trying to play a violin. He never had much education himself, the father, so he thought, all violins must sound like that. I will never want to hear a violin ever again in my life. And the same afternoon, another part of Manchester, <laughs> he heard one of the most beautiful sounds in his life. It was so sweet and melodious. He followed that to its earth source. And there he saw an old woman playing the same instrument, a violin. But this woman was a maestro. Been practicing all her life. She played so incredibly sweetly. And that's when he realized it wasn't a violin's fault, just a person hadn't yet learned how to play it properly. And he thought that's the same with all the religions in the world. Whenever you see someone who really knows how to play their instrument properly, it can be beautiful. So next, the, that evening, in a different part of Manchester, he heard a sound which was the most beautiful he'd ever heard in his whole existence. More beautiful than the sound of the water in the little streams after a heavy rain. More beautiful than the sound of the wind rustling the leaves of the trees up in the forests most beautiful sound in the world. What was that? That was the sound of an orchestra. Because everyone playing in that orchestra has spent years becoming a maestro of their instruments. But more than that, then they'd learned how to play together in harmony. The most beautiful sound. That's a challenge. You may be a good Buddhist. You may be a good um, English person. That's not good enough. Learn your tradition. Learn your role. Man, woman, transgender then please learn how to play together in harmony with others. That's possible. That's the most beautiful sound in the world when you see that. Do you know? I'm going to boast now. There was one Buddhist monk who was the first person in 2000 years to give the Sunday Sermon at a cathedral in a full Eucharist. Me. Over in Perth. I got to know the Dean really well. He said, why not? You can give good talks, tell good jokes. <laughs> come, <laughs> come and give the sermon, which I did. What a beautiful thing that is. I'll tell you another thing. I learned that to become a Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, you don't need to be a cardinal. You don't even need to be a priest. You don't even need to be Catholic. I could become the Pope as a Buddhist. Highly unlikely. But do you think I should actually send in my, my CV and apply for the position? Pope? <laughs> <laughs> when you're a monk, you can have big ideas to fit your big stomach. <laughs> Imagine what that would be like. 
Or even have a nun as Pope? Even a nun. Why not? <laughs> anyway, I kind of like this type of stuff. Why not? So anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, that's the answer I give. Is there any other questions? Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, go on. Um, I don't know if it's a question, it's not just... Uh, it's gone back a few years, but I remember when the whole question of the lunch was happening. Ah, yes. Uh, and I remember in the later time, I mean, I've been into Buddhism a few years now, I always found your talks very inspiring. You know? I think it's quite a lot of us in the same boat. So, I was actually on retreat when all that happened. And uh, <clears throat> it was quite shocking to come off retreat and find being this big disagreement, it's all criticism of yourself. Um, I found it very sad actually I mean, when you have a lot of faith in someone as a spiritual leader. So you can criticize, it's very, uh, well, maybe I'm a bit more mature now, but I kind of find it very, very hard to hear. Um, <coughs> And it must have been hard for yourself as well to have that. But I guess seeing it, it was very inspiring in the end because you did what you felt was right, even though there was a lot of opposition. There couldn't have been any more opposition. There couldn't have been any more condemnation. So it was very inspiring to see that you took what you believed was right. And it was right, it certainly might be. And I could see that that was growth, actually, for Buddhism. Very painful very hard, but it was actually growth, and it was very inspiring. Like someone like, you know, there was someone who was able to make a stand on this, even though it was extremely difficult to do. So, not so much question, you know, just I wanted to make a statement. Okay. Can you say something about what he said, because many people don't hear it, and also okay. the history, a little bit, just briefly. The history. What you meant. Of the big coonies. Why we only have one bikuni in England right now, but why are we going to have lots more? And the reason is, is one thing which I always thought when I was at school, which I hated, was doing Latin. I still remember on the desk where I used to sit in the Latin classes, some kid had carved in the graffiti Latin is a language as dead as dead could be. First it killed the Romans, now it's killing me. <laughs> but then I had to learn it. I got an O level in Latin. And the nice thing was that Latin is so close to Pali. So it was easy for me to learn Pali. When you learn Pali, which is the language of the Buddhist Sutras and Vinaya, you could read it for yourself. When I read it for myself, one of the things I found out, there's no problem at all, there's no difficulty with giving formal donation to bhikkhunis. There's no impediment at all. So then when uh, there were four nuns over in Perth, and they asked, can we have bhikkhuni ordination? Why not? And there's one thing which maybe you get from having grown up in a country like England, maybe you know, the teachings I got from my own father and mother, that you can't discriminate. Why? If it's possible and someone asks for it, then do it. So I knew there was opposition over in uh, Thailand. Actually, not so much in Thailand, believe it or not. But then people were afraid to push things forward. And I was in a fortunate position. Everybody knew that I knew my Pali and my Vinaya, the rules. And I was in a lovely monastery, which has lots of other monks who are supportive of this and the whole lay community in uh, Perth, including the Thais. I asked them, do you agree with ordaining bhikkhunis? They all said, yes. 
So I did that ordination. And of course, after the ordination, as they say here, the shit hit the fad. But I was in a very strong position. And because I'm in a strong position, yes, people can just shout at you and do this and do that. But I knew, even then, there was no turning back. And it was a good thing to do. You know, in your life, each one of you, sometimes you have a decision to make. And please, follow your heart to make that decision. Your head as well, but the heart most of all. And it's one of those occasions. <coughs> I don't know if you ever uh, read that book called Lord Jim. Lord Jim is a classic book. It was made into a film starring Peter O'Toole. And I remember he had this choice. Or is that he was taking some, a group of Muslims on pilgrimage. He was in a boat and there was a storm. And all the other Westerners who actually um, was captaining and, and, and crewing the boat, they all thought it was going to sink for sure, so they all abandoned the Muslims. And then it was this, this I think, small lieutenant, and he had the choice jump and save his life or stay with the Muslim pilgrims and do the right thing. He jumped. He made the wrong choice. And for the rest of his life, he was consumed with the guilt of that choice. He should have stayed. And as it happened, that boat managed to drift into a port. All the pilgrims were saved. And that's when he tried to find some way of paying back his debt of what he'd done. And I remember that, that moment in your life when you have a choice. Your heart says one thing, but the ease, selfishness, saving your own skin says something else. And I was lucky I made that choice to do what I thought was the right thing. The reason I say that is because I want you to do the same. Whenever that happens in your life, don't take the easy path. Take the correct path, the one which you know you can live with. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I did not do that ordination for nuns. And now it's, it's obvious. It's possible, it's legal. We're in the 20, well, even if in the second century is so the correct thing to do. So eventually it's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And obviously, honestly, it didn't hurt, not me, because he knew you were doing the right thing. And that always gave you a lot of inner strength. But I made sure. Never criticize any one of the opposite team. And hopefully you've never heard me criticize any of those people who disagree with me. If I did, you can keep my backside. It's important. Sometimes I should, religious leaders should stand up even more, no matter what it takes, no matter what the costs are. Tell me what you believe. You know, I think that was you know, probably your uncle, my dad, taught me that. Stand up for you know, what you really believe, no matter how much it costs. That's kind of answer the comment. Is there anything more? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, you're extensively. Your yeah. Have you not gotten involved in this project in any, in any way? Yeah. So, what's the first one? An alley organ. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 I think from. Okay, so the question was um, asking about Bhante Analia, who is also a very strong um, proponent. Pro 
how do you say, propagator or scholar who's uh, argued for the legal case for bhikkhuni ordination. He's, um, yeah, very supportive. And have we got him involved in the project that I'm heading in England? The main thing I think for me as a bhikkhuni is certainly to have bhikkhu allies, you know, allies in the monk sangha. And it was absolutely essential that Ajahn Brahm took that step. I think if he hadn't done, it would have closed opportunities for women for a long time because one of the things I hear most often is it's not the right time it's not the right time you know some some people say this and when they say this they're usually not the women saying this <laughs> and you wonder well who is it not the right time for because in the meantime there are women who want to go forth who are being denied the opportunity and therefore losing the meaning of their life and their calling and so we can't wait for that so thank you to Ajahn Brahm's practice, really, his courage and the results of your practice, giving you the strength to do what was right. And um, I think anybody who's really developed deeply in the Dhamma, at least from my perspective, whatever I've developed so far, I want to share. So surely if the monastic life has worked for other people, they would want to open up that possibility for women, for transgender people, gender non-binary, as many people as we can, I don't care. So, um, however, I don't know that it's necessary to kind of have, uh, I don't really know what you mean by support of Bhante Analeo. He would definitely be supportive. But I think once women are given the chance, it's up to us to lead. It's up to us to lead the projects and to do them our way. And as a woman, only I can, I can bring something different, as Ajahn Brahm was saying, you know, every um, kind of uh, facet of a person has, every person has many different qualities, many different aspects to them. And there's something as a woman that I can bring that maybe even Bhante Analio cannot. So it's... There's specific projects related yeah. to the monastery. Yeah, I mean, I don't really want to talk about individuals, but I think um, there's something about the teacher and their disciple as well, and a sense of responsibility to those you ordain, and something that we've been involved in from the beginning with this. Um, I don't think that particular monk is involved in fundraising. He lives quite a hermetic life, does a lot of retreats, and he's a scholar, so I guess it's different people for different jobs. But uh, I kind of think the best way is just to teach the Dhamma and to try and live a Dhamma life and attract people through that. So this is what I guess we're trying to do. And also create community that everyone can come and find, you know, a spiritual home, a place that they can come and practice the whole Eightfold Path, not just to be on retreat, but also to serve and to understand the meaning of service and how that enriches the path. So I think we actually have to do it <coughs> ourselves and get things going. Yeah. Mike, can you say this on the mic? Because I think everyone here would be really interested in this. It's really beautiful okay. to learn more. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I just want to reflect. I mean, it's wonderful to see a lady monk. I think it's wonderful. But I do think um, Peter was influenced by my uncle because my mother was a very strong woman and obviously she was his sister. She looked after him and she loved him unconditional. And it's so funny because he told his sons that he loved them unconditional. And my mum used to tell me that and I'm sure she told um, my uncle Billy, which was Peter's Father, who I really loved by the way. So it's funny how he's talking about family, but I do think we're very blessed if 
we had a wonderful family. And family gives you the creativity which has made you the man you are. Very good. Right, so beautiful just to bring your mother into it. <laughs> There's always some strong women in there. <laughs> Okay. Do you want to yeah. Say a few words about yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, a quick question. Yeah. And then the last question over there. Yes. Yes, please. It's not a question, actually. Um, I went, I've been over to your temple in Serpentine. Oh, great. Yeah. To come and see you. Oh, yeah. All the time, you're around. Yeah. <laughs> now you know why. <laughs> I think it was magic. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Carla must have brought us together. Yeah. yeah. And I'll most probably see you when I go back to Thailand, because I lived there most of the time. Whereabouts in Thailand? Uh, just down to a place called Bangalore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thailand, Latin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I thought, <coughs> I mean, so where, where do you live? I've been over trying to see you. I've been over there. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Marvellous. Do you know one of your uh, followers over in town? Or in, uh, yeah. Mahasamai. Yeah, Mahasamai, yeah. You know, yeah. I know him, yeah. She's a friend of Oh, excellent. And she was very disappointed. Yeah. Well, you can't be everywhere, but I try my best. <laughs> Spread myself out as much as possible. But I no, would just need to. Yeah, just to wrap up a little bit. And I just get down to the nub of things. I'm not embarrassed about saying this anymore. The next stage which the nuns need here in UK is having a place where they can grow. At the moment they're in Oxford in a small house. And I'll be down there in a few days' time. To get some growth, they need to get like a proper monastery with a bit of land and a place where you can have a few houses, not houses or huts or something, a place you can visit and you can ordain. Women can actually become nuns. However you desire, it's up to you. My own only job is to make sure I can raise enough money so you can do that. So please, if you've got a few quid you know, in the bank before somebody else takes it. Please just see if you can give a nice donation to the Anna Bikuni project. And you know somebody else who's got a few quid in the back. You know, to see if it help out. It's not trying to get money for myself. I don't get anything out of this except more work. But it's one of those things that needs to be done. If you don't have any money, I know it's hard times, but there's always some people who've got a little bit of uh, excess in their bank. And if you do, if you know them, then see if you can promote the project, have this thing actually finished, so we can have a few more people want to become fully ordained nuns. Who would like to be a fully ordained nun in the future? Put your hand up. <laughs> We don't have enough space for you right now. That's really hard. That makes me feel sad. If you're a monk, it's really easy. You go to Thailand, Sri Lanka, many places to be the Theravada Buddhist monks and nuns. But for bhikkhunis, you don't have that. I've, I've kind of done as much as I possibly can by supporting, by making sure that you know it's possible. But now, as a monk, I never earned any money at all in my life. Not as a monk. So I ask each one of you, please, if you possibly can. I've never done this before, just to ask so blatantly. It needs to be done. If not now, in the will, or whatever, I don't know. But don't die too soon, you're too important. <laughs> And the other thing is that, you know, one of the things I've seen, I've built nuns monasteries over in Australia and in uh, lots of monks monasteries. 
when you've actually done that, at this time in my life, I'm again 72, and you never know when you're going to cark it, but I'd actually die. But already I look back upon what you've done so far, and you really want to make sure that here in England, this is my homeland, so I was born. I want to make sure that there's a, a decent monastery for women, as good, or if not better than what you have for monks. You deserve it. If you have any faith and confidence or thanks to me, that's the way you pay me back. It's the best I can do. Okay. So thank you, Ajahn, for being here and for giving this wonderful talk, very moving talk, I felt. And um, yeah, you're just a total inspiration to me because my life is also about trying to do the right thing. Cheers. So it's even on water, right? We get kind of high on even on water talking about the Dhamma. So. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, and I just want to welcome all of you to join in with this. It basically means getting together more often to listen to the Dhamma and hearing it through different people, hopefully other nuns as well. And uh, Shell's going to say a few words about how you can uh, be involved in our contact details and all of that kind of logistical stuff. Um, did you want to make a very quick comment on the same theme? You just, did you want to say something? Um, I'm just going to ask if one has a responsibility towards others, but at the same time one wants to ordain as Okay. If we, can you just leave all the okay. responsibility and Right. Yeah, so somebody's asking if one has a lot of responsibilities, can they just leave them and go to ordain? So I guess it really depends on your personal situation, exactly what those responsibilities are. And again, it's about doing the right thing, feeling into your heart really deeply and knowing what things you can leave aside, what things are actually part of the path. Because ordination, renunciation is about renouncing craving, it's about renouncing sensual desire, it's not about renouncing care or support to those who need it. So it's really for you to look at and to work with and to um, maybe gradually move away in a way that doesn't leave that person struggling or bereft because we're here to teach the Dhamma and inspire others so we also need to be connected to those we love in some way. Does that have to somebody if you were to, uh, to, to, to leave for the ordination? Yes. Call what? That's ask forgiveness. Ah, uh -huh. right. You're Thai. Ask forgiveness if you're going to ordain yes. from the yes. people that you leave. Eli. And ask permission to, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in Ah, very good. What's your name? I kind of recognize you. Te Oa Te Okay. Thank you for your question. Just before everybody leaves, if you have another minute, Shell's going to just tell us how you can keep in touch and uh, how you can be involved. And thank you, everybody here, including our wonderful volunteers and also to Shell in advance. All right. Hi, everyone. So you'll see there's a desk just at, uh, behind us where you are welcome to offer generosity donations towards Annie Camper. There's also, if you join our, go onto our website, www.anitumperaproject.org forward slash donate, you're able to set up a standing order there um, to donate monthly. It really supports the Bahara, and that can even be just for the price of a coffee a month. If everyone on our mailing list, for example, did that, we would have a lot of money each month, which would take us a step closer to a full forest monastery. You're also able to email team at anacampanproject.org if you wish to volunteer your time. And that can be to serve the Sangha and the Vihara or offer up any skills you may have that might help us at the Vihara. Um, and on the website, there's also a page that will show you all the needed items for the Vihara, so things that are needed, as well as um, you can email team at Project to offer any food dialogue. And that can be done even offer the night before um, if you're unable to do it the following day. And it can be sent from afar as well. Um, and Chandra really likes it, some sushi. <laughs> um, and on the website as well, there's a list of other ways that you can support the Only Camp of the Cooney Project and the Sangha and how you can get involved in volunteering as well. Awesome. 
and there's links online to all of the teachings and our YouTube channel. Uh, so on YouTube, just search I know Camp and the Community Project and you'll get hundreds of wonderful talks. We also have all of the recordings here and on our website there's all the information about our Zoom um, sessions which include wonderful uh, meta meditations every other week. We also have wonderful suitor classes too on a Friday evening and meta chanting on a Wednesday afternoon as well as the opportunity to join in silences with some of the community online which is most common. And all of the upcoming retreats which there are many including uh, since we're up north, um, from the 28th to the 30th of December, Venerable Chandler will be teaching at uh, the Quaker House in Sheffield, a three-day day retreat. You can actually sign up just to go to individual days, and that's also on Zoom as well, so you can sign up to do that online. And then Venerable Chandler has several retreats in the UK next year, as well as Norway and the US. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I hope you see you somewhere along the way. Anything less to say? Well, please don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> so don't nod or don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you all.